All right. So thanks to all of you who were willing to tough it out to the very end. I mean, I think this was an incredibly enlightening, for me anyway, uh, meeting. I think we've learned a lot. really want to thank the experts and the panelists who helped us work through some of the tough questions we've been dealing with over the last <clears throat> many years, really. Um, I'm going to preface my concluding remarks with uh, the, um, the disclaimer that these represent sort of what I've taken away from the meeting. Many of you will have taken away slightly different things, and I hope not too many of you have taken away totally different things. Nevertheless, we will be reconvening with our experts and our planning committee to kind of go through what we've heard today. But this is, again, just kind of my distillation of some, I think, some of the important things we heard today um, that I wanted to share with everybody as part of the, my concluding remarks. So um, let me see. Can I advance? Oh, great. Thank you. So I can't advance with this, so can I advance? Is someone advancing for me? There it is. Okay. So just to remind everybody that it was an action-packed morning, um, if you can even remember that far, but we really learned a lot about current perspectives of the consumer use of uh, non-prescription products for pain and fever and what were potential unmet needs. So then if we go to the discussion... This is the session one discussion on the next slide. I've tried to, um, again, summarize on one slide, I think, the key takeaway points. Um, the first is we heard, I believe, a need for longer-acting products for both pain and fever. And this was regardless of whether they're single or combination. It's really that looks like children could benefit from products that last longer. Uh, we heard that there's generally a low risk of masking severe illness and that, honestly, if they're being developed for adults, we ought to think that they ought to, they, there should be options for children, too, if there's a need, and we heard that that was a need. Now, I think there's a, uh, certainly a need for more information on how these combination products might work for both pain and fever, but that's the kind of thing that if these products are being developed for adults, we can ask for the very studies and the information and the data gaps to be filled that are needed to support how we might use those in children. And it's really not so much of an issue of whether it's single or dual. It's really about finding the products that address these needs. So if the products happen to be being developed are single agent in adults, for example, and we have that authority uh, under our regulations or under our laws, to look at those longer-acting products if they're single agent or if they happen to be dual agents. I think the idea is that um, we ought to take the opportunities where we can when these products are being developed to study them to address this need about longer-acting products. And then I think an important point was made, and I don't want to overemphasize it, but, you know, we have a lot of problem understanding why specific products are being put in combination for cough and cold, because there's so many symptoms related to a cough and cold product, whereas we're really only talking in this space today about pain and fever, which is a much more narrow sort of uh, symptomatology treatment. So I, don't, I think there, that we have to make a distinction when we worry about the universe of cough and cold products and how many combinations there are and what drug is supposed to be used for what uh, symptom that here I think that the universe is sort of more confined. So I think that um, it was uh, what I heard was an important distinction between trying to understand what drug is being used for what in the cough and cold space versus the pain and fever space. Nevertheless, I think there was some um, interest in making sure that consumers understood, um, particularly in combination products, that these are being developed for pain and fever or pain or fever. I think we also heard in session one um, a need for considerations related to formulations. 
formulations that may be easier to give or administer and formulations that emphasize products that consumers are interested in uh, giving to their children. So sort of this idea of natural flavors and colors, um, the idea that uh, intranasal, transdermal, not more novel uh, uh, formulations could be considered. I also think we heard, importantly, uh, from our, our uh, expert, I think that was uh, uh, Jody, uh, about uh, uh, the need to remember special populations. Those who might have particular sensitivities to taste, smells, tactile, those kinds of things, and to not forget them as we're developing formulations. And certainly cost is an issue, and we certainly need to consider how these newer formulations will get paid for and how they get put on formularies. Now, again, that's not per se an FDA um, mandate, but that's certainly an issue that we heard today was a need to consider. And then finally, this is a, a thread that I think um, was uh, heard throughout the course of this uh, conference, this workshop, that, you know, look, there's a lot that we can do, it sounds like, to help in the labeling of products and the packaging and the making sure that we can be as clear as we can. But even if we're as clear as we can, there's, I think, a need to understand that, the edu that, that it doesn't end with labeling, that there is a need to make sure that prescribers, pharmacists, caregivers uh, are all educated in what we mean when we have the labeling and what the differences are that, uh, that would help the consumer to understand better what that labeling means. And we have to take into account in that education what the basic health literacy uh, uh, levels are and what the needs are in assessing and addressing health literacy, or we're going to miss the boat because we're going to try and educate people who are at a different health literacy level than we expect. So it really is all, I think, important in understanding how we get um, to a product that we think can be used safely and effectively. So on the next slide, on session two, we talked about unintended consequences and all sorts of things about, you know, mixing and matching, and but everybody's used to what we have, um, so isn't that going to rock the boat? And if it rocks the boat, is it going to rock it too much? So um, I think we heard a lot of uh, really good presentations uh, to address, um, you know, medication errors, to address health literacy, to address uh, consumer behaviors and how to test for that. So on the next slide, this is a little bit harder discussion to summarize on one slide, so it's really packed. And I didn't include everything because I'm not sure that it's necessary to include everything for this summary, and we'll talk about it as we move forward in the, in the recap and in our, in our post meeting um, discussions. But I think I heard that there are benefits to new formulations and that those benefits that we talked about in the first session really outweigh the risks, but we need to implement interventions to minimize those types of risks in any new formulation that we consider to address that um, need, particularly for longer acting. We heard that the safety profile is generally known and not generally serious for acetaminophen, at least in ibuprofen, and that we heard that labeling can probably mitigate some of these concerns, including emphasis on you know, proper dosing intervals in the age groups, making sure that we highlight what the age groups are it's not appropriate for, making sure the dosing is very clear as an example. Now, I also editorialized here myself, so I'm telling you that right now, but we heard that keeping concentration standardized as possible is a good idea. You know, the story, the great story that was told about acetaminophen and that 80 per 0.8 um, versus the uh, 160 per 5, that that was confusing. And even still with ibuprofen, 40 per 5 and 20 per 5. But I think that's really applicable to the single agent products because we know that for the combo products, there's going to be some combination and ratio. What is that ratio going to be? What is that combination going to be? It'll depend on what you know, we decide is uh, going to give us, I think, the best dosing uh, uh, flexibility and clarity for children. 
Um, and I think that a lot of that standardization that is required for these single agents goes away with the combos because you're going to have one combo. It's not like you're going to have a different combo. And, and, and the other point I'm going to make, because I have the mic and I'm just going to make it, is that, um, you know, you talked about the savvy parent who might see, well, this is lower dose, so maybe we could give a little bit more. And I was whispering to my colleagues at the table, like, that's not a savvy parent. That's someone who's trying to, like, figure something out that the labeling clearly doesn't say is okay to do. What we need to do is guard against that potential scenario where a parent who thinks that because it's a lower dose you can give more. We need to consider how we can protect against that scenario. And we need to evaluate whether or not that scenario would actually exist. Um, and I heard a lot about how we might evaluate for those particular circumstances. Now, you know, I think what I was really impressed with, and again, with the talks from the CDC and others, Rocky, uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, that, that, that this is not a new problem, that people have understood that, you know, that there's a, you know, and again, this goes back 15 or more years now with the acetaminophen story. So we kind of have some, you know, good history on this. And what we, what I think I heard from this is that they implemented some changes to this PROTECT program, you know, improving safety pack, packaging, standardizing the labeling and the formulations, and getting out educational messages and safe storage um, education programs. And that, the graphs that we saw were very impressive about how it really led to fewer medication errors. So I think we do have a path in place, and we have a lot of information already that can help us as we're moving forward with these potentially new products that could be longer acting and that might be in combination. Um, I think that, again, as I mentioned, the theme throughout is that when you change a product formulation, you need to make sure you have the right education in place. And that includes that you direct the education efforts to the right populations with the right level of education and that, you know, I got gray hair, so maybe I'm not going to learn how to do stuff on TikTok. But maybe, you know, there's social media, there's TikTok. We heard, I think, a lot of good uh, points from Casey about, you know, different ways that we can package this education to make it useful to consumers who are going to be, uh, who rely on that education. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of mitigation of risk of these product changes. So we propose a product change, and we think we have some ways to mitigate the risks that we have in our head could be, you know, really important. Um, and that requires evaluation. And I think we heard a lot, um, really appreciate our, com the, you know, the comments um, from, 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 particularly from Russ about, you know, what, what, what types of, of evaluations can be done. And, you know, we heard about a lot of different kinds of evaluations, learning comprehension, uh, labeling comprehension, labeling discernment, um, human factors, self-selection, what else? Uh, actual use. I mean, a whole panoply, a whole menu, if you will, of types of, of studies that you could consider. And what I took away from that is that, look, you have to have a rational reason for how you want to evaluate. And that, the rationale for using any of these uh, methods of evaluation depend on what is the question, what is the problem you're trying to assess? What is the risk you're trying to mitigate? And how can you assess that? Did they do that successfully? Is it being done successfully? So rather than say, well, for A, we choose B and C, and for D, we choose E and F, I think it's really more, can you provide a rationale for why you think um, these particular evaluation strategies would be useful in evaluating what you have uh, proposed to mitigate the risk. And then finally, the last two were kind of add-ons, so like kind of threw them on quickly. But, you know, are there considerations for pain-only or fever-only products? And it sounds like there could be some confusion about this um, uh, and, and that um, – I think what, what I heard was sort of the major theme was that, look, if these drugs can be used for both, then they should be labeled for both. And if they can only be used for one or the other, then that's, you know, the whole risk-benefit question we're going to have to ask. Is it worth it to have it on the market 
Um, if it's on the market for adults, is it worth it to have on, on the market for children? We have to have that question. But I think what we heard is generally for those that can be used for both, they should be labeled for both. And then finally, you know, what about adding other NSAIDs? I think what I heard was it's not necessarily a problem. We know a lot about uh, naproxen, but, you know, there may be some new NSAIDs along the way, and we'll have to cross that path when we get there. But I think we got a lot of good information today on the major question, which was kind of ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and what do we do for that? Um, and then, of course, even with that, we talked about, look, it depends on what the products are and, and, and can we provide the education that's necessary to ensure that if it's only labeled for one or the other, that it could be used safely. Okay. That's about, that's what I took from it today. And again, I, it was not intended to be comprehensive, and you may even have some difference of opinion about what I included and what I didn't include, but it's a start. So to finally end the session today, and again, um, this is probably my import, most important slide. It's really to acknowledge all the speakers, all the panelists, and all of you attendees here in this room and out in the ether um, virtually. Thank you for joining. It was really terrific um, from all aspects, I would say. And special thanks go to the workshop planning committee. I really want to acknowledge, I hope Heather is still here. Oh, there she is. Heather, could you stand up? Because I really think that we need to give. <laughs> there are, there, you know, you can see all the people here who are kind of the brains behind it on the FDA side. Heather was the muscle. I mean, she really, you know, um, worked hard. And Yvette, oh, I'm sorry, Yvette's back there too. And Yvette too. Thank you, Yvette. Heather and Heather and Yvette really, I mean, were the muscle behind getting this together, so thank you so much. I do want to also especially acknowledge our colleagues from M. Searcy, Dana, uh, Kiesia, Eric, and Jim, and then, of course, our Cracker Jack FDA meeting staff, um, Brittany, uh, Elodie, and Ian. Thank you so much for the superb support you've given us today during the meeting. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you, and I would... I'd uh, like to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all again.